The T-72 main battle tank was built specifically to overwhelm NATO forces. Swarms and waves upon waves of T-72s can trample everything in their path and swallow all opposition completely whole. And of course, all the allies of the Soviet Union had their own T-72 stocks too. The solution? The A-10 Warthog. Tank Killer. Angel of Death. This jet was designed specifically as the machine to foil any such ambitions. After that T-72 tank swarm failed to materialize, the Warthog continued to save the lives of countless NATO troops in deployments around the globe. The distinct buzzing of its cannon as it flew past became a source of comfort and a signal of safety. For something to reach that sort of status, it must be a work of art. Indeed it is. And that's why we'll take a deep look into it, and you'll get to know why there's nothing like the A-10 Warthog. The Flying Tank Killer Many of you may be surprised to know that the idea of a ground attack jet dedicated specifically to destroying tanks and armored vehicles as quickly as possible came from the Soviet Union, the same enemy that the A-10 was supposed to fight. Others with good knowledge about World War II won't be surprised. Enter the IL-2 Sturmovik. It was the most mass-produced combat aircraft ever built, standing at 36,000 units. After seeing how the German Ju-87 Stuka effectively provided direct support to ground units by destroying enemy tanks and bunkers, the Soviets decided to do the same, with the addition of armor for their plane. After initial deployments in 1941, Sturmovik pilots realized that the armor of their aircraft provided substantial protection against machine gun fire and even 25mm explosive shells. This durability earned it the nickname Concrete Bomber among the German fighter pilots sent to stop them. Despite heavy losses among IL-2 formations, they could not be stopped and they proved to be effective in campaigns such as the Battle of Kursk in 1943 and the recapture of Belarus in 1944. It destroyed German tanks, armored vehicles, bunkers, and even ships, with one Lieutenant Colonel Nelson Stepanyan being credited for destroying 13 German ships in the Baltic Sea, alongside the elimination of hundreds of light vehicles. The Americans were watching and taking notes. The idea of a flying tank for the purpose of countering land tanks could prove useful, as it seemed the German way of armed warfare was going to be the way of the future. Voices in support of a dedicated and heavily armed ground attack aircraft design were growing. These voices, however, were drowned out by those that invested heavily in the idea of high-speed fighter bombers that would drop nukes off and be done with it. These spawned the F-105 Thunder Chief and the F-101 Voodoo. U.S. Navy planners also had their way as they felt that they only needed a relatively light armed piston engine propeller plane to support combat actions on the coast. This resulted in the A-1 Sky Raider, and it was already being designed during World War II. But the kind of war that the U.S. Air Force, USAF, was hoping to fight with the F-105s and F-101s never materialized, and the U.S. forces would find themselves stuck in the thick forests and mud of Vietnam, where the enemy refused to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The USAF began using the A-1 Sky Raiders too, as they had nothing capable of providing close air support. In this war, ambushes and close-range fighting would reign, and the A-1 Sky Raider was not up to the task. 266 Sky Raiders were lost in Vietnam in total, and it was discovered that its armaments were not enough. After a proposal to adopt the Navy's A-7 Corsair, which was being developed simultaneously, was shot down due to high costs, General John McConnell, the then USAF Chief of Staff, ordered the design and creation of a close air support aircraft. The Warthog's Rise Thus, the AX program was launched in 1967 to invite designs for consideration. Three years later, after the collection of more data from the A-1 Sky Raider and the A-7 Corsair, the program requirements were amended to include the iconic 30mm rotary cannon with a minimum RPM of 40,000, alongside the ability to carry guided missiles and rocket pods. Fairchild Republic put the famed Georgian aeronautical engineer Alexander Cartley to the task of designing it. 
He had previously designed the F-105 and knew just how to craft his new creation with the new requirements. The A7 Corsair was still in the fight as a new variant, but again, nothing could stop the A10 from being put into serial production from 1976 onwards. It simply had the superior airframe, which allowed it to be armored while still keeping optimal flight performance. The initial A10A variant had upgrades, such as an inertial navigation system, paid penny laser pods for Hellfire missiles, and anti-radiation missile loading capabilities over the course of five to six years after its introduction. The ability to carry laser-guided missiles was particularly prized, as it allowed the plane to snipe Soviet tanks and command posts while staying out of range of Soviet anti-air artillery. For defending against Soviet anti-air missiles, it was equipped with extensive electronic countermeasure suites, allowing it to be configured for SEAD missions, otherwise known as suppression of enemy air defenses. It was deployed to Germany, the projected flashpoint of a conventional World War III in which the A-10 would be put to the test it was designed for. Despite its durability and its offensive capabilities, Air Force top brass grimly predicted that 10 A-10s would be shot down every 24 hours in the event of large-scale operations by the Soviet Union. Initially, the low speed coming in at 675 km per hour was its main disadvantage, as it wasn't considered an adequate enough speed to be able to have a chance at surviving anti-air missiles. Furthermore, the plane's engines jut out vertically in the back, and many pilots were wary of the risks associated with birds flying into the engines. USAF pilot cadets didn't seem too keen on being A-10 pilots. The 80s came and the Soviet Union fell, and in 1991, Iraq had just invaded Kuwait. Part of the air war of Operation Desert Storm included the A-10s as a crucial element, and the planes finally had their chance at tank killing. The result? 987 tanks destroyed, 501 armored personnel carriers destroyed, 249 command posts and 72 bunkers destroyed, and even two air-to-air -air kills with the AIM-9 Sidewinder. Its combat prowess had been proven, and after upgrades in the late 90s and early 2000s to bring them up to the A-10C variant, it had served effectively in providing close air support to NATO troops, saving countless members from deadly ambushes in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Hog's Future Only minor upgrades have followed the A-10C, as it's still the most advanced variant of the A-10 currently in service. As it stands in 2023, the USAF has no plans for an effective replacement for the A-10. Yes, we know that they want the F-35 to do what the A-10 did, but such an idea is widely criticized. Concerns were raised from the very beginning by the Senate. The F-35 will not do close air support missions the same way the A-10 does. Frank Kendall III, then serving as the Pentagon's top acquisition official, told the Senate Armed Services Committee in April 2016, It will do it very differently. The A-10 was designed to be low and slow and close to the targets it was engaging, relatively speaking. We will not use the F-35 in the same way as the A-10. Maybe they do have a plan, but not everyone is convinced. Close air support aircraft have to be durable and cheap enough to produce rapidly to replace the rapid losses that these aircraft usually suffer in combat. Each F-35 costs $75 million to buy and much more to maintain as it's fast and light enough for air-to-air -air combat. The A-10, on the other hand, is specialized and costs a fraction of that money. Its most recent update as part of a software upgrade allows it to carry a larger consignment of bombs than previously. These small updates so far seem to be the way they want to keep these old airframes running, allowing them to engage in niche combat roles. It's also being tested as a dedicated decoy drone launcher for fooling enemy radar detection. The recent Russian invasion of Ukraine has seen intense armored combat action and the involvement of the A-10's Russian counterpart, the Su-25 Frogfoot. There have been a lot of engagements where close air support would have been critical. Examples include the Battle of Propozhna, the Battle of Bakhmut, and the currently ongoing Ukrainian counteroffensive in the Zaporizhia region. We have to wait and see if the USAF and the Department of Defense change their mind about whether or not they want a new armored tank killer aircraft, 
maybe with stealth capabilities this time around. The A10 has never been approved for export, as the 30mm GAU-8 uses depleted uranium, the storage of which is a pain. Additionally, it was deemed too expensive to use by most potential export customers, and their close air support needs were fulfilled by multi-role fighter aircraft or attack helicopters. Therefore, we can't expect the Ukrainian Air Force to field second-hand A-10s to replace or supplement their own Su-25 stocks. They'd have to make do with the potential F-16 stocks that they may receive. It's unfortunate, though, as this is the ideal low-lying and flat battlefield that the A-10 was designed to reign over all, dating back to the 1980s. Now, we'd love it if you sent a laser-guided missile to the subscribe button. Consider giving this video a thumbs up as well if you like what you've seen. Thanks for watching.